our faith, and we must find some way to live within the all of it. May 1966, I was in Hollywood, Florida, a youth leader attending my first General Assembly on my way to the Ware Lecture. And the doors of the elevator opened, and there he was, standing with his attendants. May I shake your hand? Dr. King, I'm so honored to meet you. What is your name, young man? Bill Sinkford. And where are you from, son? Cincinnati, Ohio, sir. Well, there's plenty of work yet to do in Cincinnati. <laughs> we reached the ground floor, and he moved off to the green room to prepare to preach. And preach he did, a prophetic sermon urging our faith not to sleep through the revolution. Stay woke, as the movement for black lives urges us today. How can I describe it for those of you who were not even born then? It felt like we were in the midst of a revolution and that Unitarian Universalists were important actors in the revolutionary drama. Dr. King called on the church to lead. When the church is true to its nature, he said, it stands as the moral guardian of society. He called on the church and on each one of us to be maladjusted to the structures of society that corrupt and oppress, and every head in the audience nodded in affirmation. The rhetoric was vintage MLK. It may be true that the law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. The law cannot make a person love me but it can restrain that person from lynching me. Still, Dr. King claimed that love was not only present, but at the very heart of the revolution in which we were engaged. And our faith community listened with rapt attention. Dr. King ended with the vision of the beloved community. His sermonic close returned to the dream. We will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of unity and speed up that day when all God's children will be able to walk the earth as brothers and sisters, as siblings, and then we can sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, Free at last! Thank God Almighty we are free at last! And thousands of Unitarian Universalists, many like me with tears streaming down their faces, rose in thunderous applause. You see, we were ready to redeem the American dream. We were ready to take our place in the revolution. Well, what was our role to be? James Baldwin, writing just three years before in The Fire Next Time, put it this way. If we, the relatively conscious ones, who must, like lovers, create the consciousness of others, if we do not falter in our duty now, we may be able to end the racial nightmare and achieve our country and change the history of the world. Unitarian Universalists, we were more than ready to claim that role as some of the conscious ones. Not, not relatively conscious, mind you. Most Unitarian Universalists listening to Dr. King believed that they were fully enlightened and up to the task of enlightening others. Arrogance, you see, has been a spiritual issue f with us for a very long time. <laughs> and that black youth leader, me, well, I believed it too.
and I was filled with hope not only for our nation but for this faith. 1966, 50 years ago, so many dreams deferred, so many dreams denied. How did we get from I have a dream to the new Jim Crow and the massacre in Orlando? Fifty years on, how did Unitarian Universalism get from that commitment to redeem the American dream to the need to hang Black Lives Matter banners on our churches and stand vigil as the pulse of life is brutally cut short once again by hate. Did we fall asleep at the switch? Well, that's hard to argue when marriage equality is now the law of the land, there's greater opportunity for women and girls, and the Americans with the Disabilities Act is now in places, in place. It's not that progress is complete on any of those fronts, but we've been hard at work. We've marched, we've petitioned, we've protested, many of us. But the racial nightmare has not been ended. And religious bigotry, xenophobia, and homophobia are still used to justify hatred. In fact, we found more excuses to keep us divided than most of us could have imagined 50 years ago. Did we somehow take our eyes off the prize? Or did Dr. King's dream provide a flawed lens that prevented us from seeing all that we needed to see? Dr. King, some of you will remember, continued to expand that dream, addressing militarism, income inequality, and immigrant workers. I wonder if he would be so revered if he had not been killed. Because America insisted on embracing not Dr. King's expanding and challenging vision of the beloved community, which embraced more and more and more of us, but the far more comfortable dream of equal opportunity and the vision of innocent children sitting together at the American table or at least in the American schoolroom, that dream which was centered more on love than on struggle. I wonder, I wonder what Dr. King would preach to us today. I'm sure that he would have built gender equality and women's reproductive rights into his vision. Sexual orientation and gender identity absolutely would be there. People of color would probably be his language, not just black and white. All of those things, I think, would be there, but more. I think he would condemn the war on drugs just as he condemned the Vietnam War, and for the same reason. Both are waged on the backs of the poor and people of color. I think he would be calling income inequality a moral failure not just an economic reality, and I think he would rail against religious bigotry, the building of walls on our borders, and the banning of Muslims from our shores. He would call people of faith to be divinely dissatisfied with the world as it is now, just as he was divinely dissatisfied with the world as it was when he lived. But he would also be asking why corporations and entertainers pull out of states that try to roll back LGBTQ rights, but not when states roll back voting rights. And for all our progress on these other issues, as important as they are, he would be insistent that the beloved community will always be incomplete, flawed, its very foundation compromised, 
until the racial nightmare is ended. Now, Dr. King is not with us now, and so it falls to us to find and hold a dream for the beloved community. That is our religious work. Our religious work, not my religious work. Because like people of color in progressive communities all around the world, I've been trying to fix this problem all my life. And in Unitarian Universalism, I've been trying to help us move toward wholeness on the issue of race for decades. If I had the solution, if I had a magic wand to wave, some answer that could transform us and our world, we would have been living in the beloved community for years now. And I don't pretend to have that answer, but I do have a message. There are some things that I think I know. There is a reason that our nation hastened to embrace that warm and fuzzy dream of an American welcome table where exceptional individuals can transcend their circumstances. That dream allowed us all, but especially white Americans, to maintain a belief in their own innocence. And I hear statements of innocence all the time. I never owned any slaves. I didn't create the war on drugs. Some of my best friends are Muslim, Mexican, gay, put in the category that you would like to think about. I am not a bigot. Now, most of us have done enough work to understand the flaws in that logic. Most of us have. But Ta-Nehisi Coates argues that it is exactly that American dream of white innocence from which we most need to awake, awaken. He writes, the process of washing the disparate tribes white, the elevation of the belief in the dream of being white, was not achieved through wine tastings and ice cream socials, but rather through the pillaging of life, liberty, labor, and land. And these new white people have forgotten the scale of the theft that enriched them. They have forgotten because to remember would tumble them out of the beautiful dream and force them to live down here with us, down here in the world. In the dream, they are Buck Rogers, Prince Aragorn, a whole tribe of Skywalkers. To awaken them, is to reveal that they are merely an empire of humans. The American dream, this new white identity, it requires a vivid performance of innocence, as one commentator describes it, despite the truth that there is no actual innocence and there never was. Now, I'm going to bring it on home here. <laughs> even progressive religious folks, even Unitarian Universalists, have to give up our innocence. You see, despite the fact that we were ready to sign on to Dr. King's dream, we soon pulled back as a faith community when it became clear that the passage of a few laws was not going to save us. Some of us remember the late 1960s and early 70s. It was a time when dreams of integration were challenged by demands for black empowerment, days when it got too hard and painful for our congregations to stay involved. You can read about that period if you did not live it. It's often called the black empowerment controversy. 
I prefer to describe it as a fit of white entitlement. So you can read about that period if you did not live it, but the reality is that we withdrew. And when our faith withdrew from the racial justice conversation, many, many people of color who had joined us withdrew too. Feeling betrayed, we left Unitarian Universalism. I was one of them, but there were so many others. And I could call some of their names, but you do not know them because they are not here. They did not find their way back to this faith like I did, and we will never know what this faith might look like or be like today if they could have remained. Our faith looked away. We did not stay woke. And whether we feel guilt for that or shame, and even if we denied it, the truth is that we all of us are complicit. We did not prevent the racial nightmare from continuing. Just as we have not ended homophobia for all of our work and witness, there is no innocence left for any of us. And there's one more thing. Tanahasi Coates tells his son, here is what I want you to know. In America, it is traditional to destroy the black body. It is heritage. Coates' son needs to know that his body is at risk, that he can be killed with impunity, just as my son and my grandsons need to know that, just as I know it every time I drive on rural roads at night or am stopped on city streets. In America, it is traditional to destroy the black body and the gay body and the immigrant body. It is heritage. Now, these are hard words, but they explain so much. Ferguson and Tamir Rice make sense. The new Jim Crow, racial profiling, violence on the border, even Orlando, it is of a piece. And I've known these things all my life. On these issues, I consider myself to be one of the conscious ones, but Coates forced even me to confront truths that I would rather avoid because I would rather believe in the power of love. You know I would, and so would you. What I know is this. We are being given another chance. The racial justice and just plain justice movement, Black Lives Matter, that emerged out of the tragedies on the streets of Ferguson and Cleveland and Baltimore and Portland, where I serve, that movement is offering us the chance to claim a fuller and ultimately a more hopeful dream. And even, even the response to Orlando is also helping to point the way. Let me ask you, how many of you stood vigil in your community last week? Raise your hands. How many joined with others, lit a candle, said a prayer, heard the names called. The image of those vigils is where I am seeing hope this week. The rainbow flags were most easily seen, but if you looked just a bit more closely, you saw all of us present there, young and old, queer and straight, cisgender and transgender, Muslim men and Muslim women with their heads covered, Christians, Jews, atheists, Unitarian Universalists, Latinos and Anglos, black 
and brown and many, many shades of beige. We were all there. The tragedy of Orlando calls us to demolish the walls around our vision and claim that fundamental universalist truth that we are all children of God, each and every one of us. The vigils called us to stand in solidarity in our grief and to stand as a community of resistance, resistance to the hate and the bigotry and the fear. We were communities of resistance that gathered. And perhaps that is how we need to begin to understand ourselves, not as the already conscious leaders waiting for the deluded dreamers to awaken, but as one community of resistance struggling to stay awake and aware ourselves, one community of resistance to the hate and the violence ready to partner with other communities of resistance, climate activists showing up at Black Lives Matter demonstrations and Black Lives Matter banners marching in pride parades. begin to see ourselves as communities of resistance willing to build a more embracing dream together. Because resistance is what love looks like in the face of hate. And resistance is what love looks like in the face of violence. Are we willing to live as if the beloved community is more than just an idle dream? Are we willing to love this faith and love ourselves enough not to settle for the world as it is, but to build and inhabit the world we dream about? Will we trust this faith, this faith that does believe in the power of love? Will we trust this faith enough to help us find a new way? a way out of no way, because it is only together that we can find the courage and the will not to look away this time. Will you pray with me now? Spirit of life, great mystery at the heart of things, dear God, may we find the strength to remember both how we have triumphed and how we have failed. Help us find the courage to know as much of the truth as we can bear. Help us find the courage to answer the call of love once again, to stand against hate and resist the violence that the world urges us to accept. This is our world, and these are our bodies. Help us find a way to live within the all of it and allow love to call us on toward hope. Amen.